Do you guys like the Marvel movies? Do you like Norse mythology? Do you like Renaissance fashion? Because I got all of those for you. Hey, Sun Space Sun, I'm Daisy Victoria, and welcome to Asgard, the home of the Norse gods in both historical religious practice and in the Marvel universe. How many of you guys are Marvel fans? I know there's like so many Marvel movies and TV shows out there now. There's so many to choose from and a lot to catch up on if you want to watch all of them. And today we're going to be exploring Loki, who has his own TV show now. Yay! Go Loki! Congratulations! You made it! I really have enjoyed the Loki TV show. I think it's really well done. It's really interesting. And if you guys haven't seen it, the basis is that there are all these different universes that make up the multiverse and there's a version of a character in each universe that's different. So there's a version of Loki coming from each universe. So you've got like the Lady Loki, you've got other versions of Loki, you've got Alligator Loki, and there's just so much potential for original design cosplay Lokis. Surprise, they're now all canon. Oh, another thing I loved about the Loki TV series is so when Loki goes to the TVA, which is the Time Variance Authority, the building where they filmed that is very easily recognizable as the Atlanta Marriott Marquis, AKA the Dragon Con Hotel. That's right, all my fellow Dragon Con goers are going to recognize that place immediately it is iconic. Given that I go to Dragon Con every year, and so does my friend Estelle. Estelle is a friend that's so close that we've decided that we are sisters. And as important as Norse mythology is to me in general, Loki holds a very special place in my sister Estelle's religious practice. And I like Loki too. I mean, I kind of like all the stories with his mischief and trickery. It, it just makes fun stories, and who doesn't like that? I thought it would be fun to do a Loki variant. Now my friend Lelena, I know guys, I'm bringing in so many friends here. <laughs> I guess it's only two. So my friend Lelena and I decided to do historical Loki variants, and I decided, okay, what I want to do is, first of all, I love beautiful princess gowns, and also Loki has horns. I know something else that has horns and that is 16th century Venetian ladies. So I decided to do Loki so I could do the horn hairstyle and yeah, perfect, right? I thought so. In this video, we're gonna go through the making of the actual dress portion. I do have another video on making the stand-up lace collar and another video on making the cutwork sleeves. So I will link those to you, as well as the playlist of all of my colleagues who decided to join in and make historical Loki variants. Now there are many more historical Loki variants out there than just those of us who have uploaded to YouTube. And we are using the hashtag historical Loki variants over on Instagram, TikTok, whatever other social media you like. So go ahead and use that too. And also show me what you did because I really like inspiring people and I like feeling inspired too. So I hope that we can share and I hope you guys like it. So what's kind of funny about this project for me is that it's based on Marvel Loki, but I am less inspired by Marvel Loki than I am by Norse mythology Loki. That said, that's why I chose more of the Norse mythology Loki symbolism when I designed this dress. And to me, that makes it just a little bit more personally special. But I also hope that in showing it off, I can just give you guys some inspiration for doing something that you're passionate about or just making a pretty dress in general. <laughs> For this project, I found some beautiful gold Venetian lace, which you've actually already seen in the lace collar and the sleeves. I really loved both of these lace patterns, and so I knew I wanted to incorporate both of them into the design. The main fabric of my dress is a green silk taffeta, which is so beautiful, and it was really a treat to get to work with this fabric. I got this from the Silk Baron, who has a beautiful assortment of silk fabrics. Not sponsored, but I wouldn't mind a sponsorship. 
before I get started today, I'm gonna have to clean up because I basically threw the dress I wore to Ren Faire in the middle of my workspace and Loki stuff is kind of spread out in a pile. So we're gonna have to get that under control. Then we're gonna get to work. The pattern I'm using is one that I've previously drafted. It's actually very similar to the pattern drafting instructions I have for the Renaissance Kirtle in my shop. And you can see me work with that one a little bit more in some other videos on my channel. The main difference here is simply that the bodice is pointed down in both the front and the back. So I've taken that same bodice shape, which I use for the sort of generic Renaissance kirtle tutorial. And what I've done is extended it down in the front, as you can see in that front pattern piece. And then I also gave it a point in the back as well. The bodice of my dress is lined in this black linen and it is interlined in a cotton canvas. That is all for structure and stability. I will be putting in a few pieces of boning, but not a whole lot. The skirt of the dress is just big rectangles of silk taffeta. I basically did this the same way as the generic Renaissance kirtle. The main interesting Thing here is that I am cartridge pleating this onto the waistband, which you will see when I get to that step. So I've gotten pretty good starts on pieces of this project. The skirt is basically sewn together into panels. It's gonna need to be cut to match the curve of the bodice. It needs to be hemmed, then pleated onto the bodice. The bodice is kind of sewn into pieces of the, you know, the fashion fabric and the lining. Um, I do need to sew the boning channels and then get everything ready to put together. The sleeves are going to take a long time. I've cut them out, but because I want to do cut work, I need to design the cut work and then get that all done. And then there's so many details left in finishing it. So you know what? I am going to work for the time I have left today and we're going to see how far I get. and. I'm just gonna be okay with finishing it next week. That's just how it's gonna go. Okay, now get ready for my super secret trick. This is not really a secret, but it is a super trick. So when putting the bodice together, I don't want to have to finish off the armholes separately later. Now, just like I've shown you in other videos, sometimes I do like a bias binding around there, but this time I wanted it just to be nice and smooth without having to do a lot of hand stitching. We're going to sew around the front edge all the way around that neckline to the other front edge. We're also going to sew the shoulder openings and then that is the lining to the outer fabric. We're gonna turn that right side out and we're gonna sew the side seams after that. That's going to allow us to sew all of that by sewing machine with no visible machine stitches and looking really nice and smooth and clean. So 
right now we basically have the entire opening sewn um, fashion fabric to lining and that goes all the way from the bottom points on the front up and around the neckline. It's also sewn lining to outer fabric around these two arm openings. And that allows us to then turn it right side out. I've sewn boning channels in a few places on the bodice. There's a boning channel at the center front on each side of the opening. There's one that goes diagonally from the bottom of there up like toward the armpit. There are boning channels in the center back along the seam allowance. And I'm also putting boning right next to those seams that is gonna be basically like the side back seam. wondering how incredibly thoughtful I am and how thoroughly I plan every step of every process I do. I finished off the bottom of my bodice without inserting the boning first. And I did that two minutes before my stop working alarm went off yesterday. Didn't have time to redo it, so that's how I'm starting today. I chose to zigzag the edge because it finishes it off a little bit. You can also serge it on a serger, but I have to rip out some of the zigzags so I can stick my boning in there. I'm using one quarter inch flat steel boning. Sometimes when I make these bodices, I use one half inch steel in the front and a quarter inch in the back, just to give a little more bust support. If you have any questions making your own, the half inch will make sure you get more support, but if you are wearing a garment underneath, you pretty much just need to make sure the bodice stays upright rather than giving you support. So if you're wearing a boned bodice under your bodice, whether that's, you know, stays, pair of bodies, whatever um, is appropriate for the period or influence that you're going for, you just need to make sure your outer bodice has structure to not like get wrinkly, you know, so just something to keep it in place. So this is going to be open across the front, like pretty far, which is exactly what I wanted. And it kind of meets here at the center front, like so. Oh my gosh, I love it. It looks so good. And I'm so excited. I've been working on this for so long. This project was supposed to be done weeks ago and just other stuff has come up that's taken priority and it's okay. But my goodness, to be making this much progress feels really freaking amazing right now. In order to get that curve, on the skirt, which we don't have in the original kirtle instructions. So if you are using those instructions and you're adapting them to this, this part is gonna be really important for you. Basically, I'm finding the difference between the waist and where the bottom of my points are for both the front and the back pieces. And then I'm going to need to trim that much off of my skirt panels. So if you're four inches lower, then you're gonna need to trim to four inches. And I try to make kind of straight lines using my handy dandy ruler. That way when you gather the skirt on, it will already be shaped to the correct height all across the bodice. If you haven't watched my video on how to do a cartridge pleated petticoat, 
I do recommend you go ahead and watch that because I'm not going to spend so much time really instructing you how to cartridge pleat here. We're just going to kind of go through making the dress. I like to use these ribbons to help me gauge my cartridge pleating. Anything that's like striped, checkered, plaid, anything that has an equidistant pattern along it, you can use to help you gauge. So I just sew that right on there, make my life a little bit easier, make my pleats nice and even. I like it. It's just those little hacks you can use to make your life better. Cartridge pleating has to be done by hand, and I did this sitting on the sofa. It's just one of those activities that takes a little bit of time, and I think it looks really, really nice. My cartridge pleats are sewn onto my bodice, and what's a little bit different here than the other petticoat is that I'm actually sewing both sides of the cartridges down, whereas I only sewed one side on the petticoat because I wanted them to stand out away from the waistband. Here I want the pleats to be flush with the bodice, so I sewed on the one side to the bottom edge of the bodice, and then I sewed on the other side of the cartridges or the pleats. They look like cartridges, so you know. Sewing both sides of those pleats down makes them lay kind of flat off of the bodice. And the bottom edge of the bodice was finished off before attaching those pleats onto it, so that way it doesn't have a raw edge inside. These are my lacing rings that I am using for the front of the bodice. They are little metal O-rings. You could use D-rings or, you know, whatever little hooks you like. I have two O-rings that I am sewing onto the shoulders of my bodice, and that is so that I can attach the collar to those. As you saw in the collar video, that needs to be secured onto the bodice. Jewelry time on a gown like this is so fun. I just love these little metal filigree pieces, and I love playing with them to get the sort of effect that you see in the Renaissance paintings. I'm using a lot of gold filigrees, and I'm attaching little rhinestones into the center of them with gem tack. And all of this is in that green and gold color scheme because we are Loki here and we like green and gold. really hoping this wig would style itself, but I guess I'm gonna have to do it. The wig was a little bit of a challenge. It's been a while since I styled a wig with an updo anything like this, so it was kind of cool to challenge myself again. To create the horned hairstyle, I used a headband as the base for an inner structure in the wig. I drew out cones using craft foam, and that is basically giving me a little hollow shape that I can wrap the wig hair around. I covered each cone in black felt. That's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, the hair on the wig is black. That's because Marvel Loki has black hair. 
and I want to make sure that I don't see white foam if any hair moves out of place. I want that to be black. Also, the felt has a texture that's a little bit more sort of sticky for hair than the craft foam. And I figured that will certainly help me when I am wrapping the hair around these structures. Now there isn't really a specific method or technique to creating this hairstyle. I just basically draped the hair from my wig, keeping in mind what the Italian Renaissance images of these ladies look like, and also remembering that it's Loki and we want to go for the extreme. So these are actually rather large hair horns, exactly how I like it. I left some hair down in the front and started basically wrapping the other hair around those cones to create the basis for the hair horns. I used a lot of this hairspray on my wig. It's good old got to be glued freezing blast spray and it works really well on wigs in my experience. The back of the hair, as well as those pieces from the front, is wrapped around to create a bun in the back of the head. I added in some really curly extension hair. I basically wrapped that around the hair horns and around the front and around to the back of the wig. I did that because I thought the wig needed a little more curl. And when I wear the wig, what's really cool is that I can pin these hair extensions down past the edge of the sort of lace front hair wig portion. And that allows me to style it a little bit more naturally onto my head as well. And I think it looks really cool. So you live where it's hot, but you want to wear a super fancy schmancy warm dress. Get yourself an apron with pockets in it, and you can put those ice packs right against your legs underneath all the layers of your dress. It's especially nice if you get them close to your arteries, which will carry that coolness down all the way down your legs. I also put ice packs in my bodice. I like to put those sort of by my armpits. These ones are a little rounder than what's ideal, but you know, we work with what we have. And boom, now you can wear a super fancy warm dress when it's hot out and you won't die. But you should still pay attention to your body, drink lots of water, stay hydrated, take care of your body. You only got the one. Ice packs worked great. I made it long enough to get all the photos and footage I need, which is really not that much. I was pretty efficient. 
With a dress like this, I love it so much. I think it's a real work of art. And also, I try to get the most out of when I do wear it because I know that I'm not gonna wear it very often. It's just not that practical. It's a lot of layers and it's very warm. Also, it took me about two hours to get dressed by myself, including makeup and everything but it was a little fussy. It would have taken a lot less time with someone to help, but still, you know, I really like admiring dresses like this, and I feel really, really proud to know that I can make them. Like, it feels like such an accomplishment to do, like, the cutwork sleeves and all the details and everything. Also, I kind of like wearing stuff I can move around in a lot and just get it dirty and not worry about it. And this one is silk, not meant to get dirty. It's really a court dress. I mean, that's what it was in period, so. If you've enjoyed this video, I really hope you will subscribe and check out more of my work. You can find me on all the social medias as Daisy Victoria. My website is daisyvictoria.com. And a special thank you to my patrons over on Patreon who help me so much to continue creating content for all of you. I hope you have an amazing, magical day. And I will see you again real soon.